Hello, and welcome to Pacific Mammal Research's Marine Mammal Highlight Series. We are a research and education nonprofit studying marine mammals in the Salish Sea off Washington State. In this series, you will learn about different marine mammals as we discuss the interesting facts about each species and debate which one we think is the best. Of course, we think all marine mammals are awesome. This is just our way to geek out, share some information, and have some fun. We hope you enjoy this series, and if you want to hear about a particular marine mammal, let us know in the comments. And without further ado, welcome to the next Marine Mammal Highlights series. Uh, I'm Cindy. I'm Kat. And I'm Trevor. And we are going to be this week talking about orcas. So uh, there's quite a few orcas, and actually, um, for I was those just going to say, that are viewing <laughs> right <laughs> top left on YouTube here, you can see <laughs> all the different types of orcas we have on the picture or on the poster in the back. Um, so Kat is going to start us off by talking about all those different types of orcas, and then we'll kind of narrow it down to the ones that we have here in the Sailor Sea and talk about them. Yeah. So I mean, as you guys can see from that, well, if you are watching on YouTube, you can see from that picture. If not, we'll put a link down below where you can actually go look at this ecotype poster because it's really cool. Um, the artwork, I believe, was all done by our friend Uva Gorder um, out of Seattle. So he does a beautiful job of um, marine mammal illustration in general. But um, it's a really fun infographic to just give you a context for how many different types of orca there are in the world and how they all visually look different. So one of the main things that we're going to talk about in this introduction um, is the concept of an ecotype and basically what that means and what it is and how it relates to orcas. So, so first off, what, one, th one thing I wanted, I wanted to note was that I think most people when they think of orcas probably think of the southern residents that I'm going to be talking about later. I, I think a lot of people do. At least in the U.S. Yeah, in probably. the U.S. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's just really important to highlight there's quite a few different orcas. So right. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, first off, just a little bit of a background into orcas in general. So orcas, as most of you probably know, are the largest dolphin species. Um, and they're actually found in every ocean in the world. So they're one of the most widely distributed um, delphinids there is, yeah, pretty much. Which is um, interesting, because you always think about do bottlenose dolphins being that, but they don't, right, they don't yeah. have in colder waters, which orcas do. Like, exactly. Not that orcas are dolphins either. Right. right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, pretty much the, the initial thinking when we kind of first started to realize that orcas were this widely distributed, um, orcas also known as killer whales, um, that may be the other name that you know them by. Um, which which is, is from actually uh, the Spanish word or Spanish thing for whale killer. Yes. Because it they saw them kill whales, right, because they'll kill some of them will eat larger whales. Um, and so the name just kind of got switched over time. Yeah, because yeah, a lot of people hear that name and they're black and white and they're pretty big and intimidating. They're like, oh my gosh, they're killer whales. And it's like, right. no, actually no. they kill whales. Some of them, <laughs> we'll get into right. that, but some of them <laughs> kill whales. Um, yeah, they're also known as sea wolves because they do hunting packs. Um, mm -hmm. So that's another kind of anecdotal name that they've acquired. Um, Ooh, and just so like real it, quickly on the, on the names, just gonna have one more thing on that. The Roman mythology or sinus means of the kingdom of the dead or belonging to Orcus, the ruler mm -hmm. of the dead. That is cool. Yeah. And then As the if they weren't already cool enough <laughs> and already like kind of secret agent enough, like that's awesome. That's pretty epic. And then the Latin orca means the shape of a barrel or a cask. So I guess because they're kind of barrel shaped. Hmm. Interesting. Good. Wonder if yeah. that's to do with their head because their head is kind of a bulbous mm, shape. Possibly. Yeah. Interesting. So, you know, again, as you can see, if you are watching on YouTube or you can just Google a picture of an orca, if you don't know what <laughs> they look like, they're black and white. They're very striking. Um, the males have a really distinctive dorsal fin. The male dorsal fin tends to get very, very tall. It can get up to about six feet tall and is very triangular. Pretty impressive. Um, taller than most people. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and like I said, I mean, they occur all around the world in a wide variety of different habitats too. So they occur both in open seas and oceanic waters, also in coastal waters. Um, and they also have, as a species, they actually have the most varied diet out of all different cetaceans. And part of that is because quite a few of them have become specialized to the diet of where they particularly live. Um, and according to the NOAA website, there are actually an estimated around 50,000 killer whales globally. 
um, which is pretty cool. And then here in the north, uh, north, eastern North Pacific Ocean, so on the west coast of the US and Canada, um, we have approximately around 2,500 killer whales living in this area, we think. Um, estimated. Estimated, exactly. Um, and so getting into the concept of ecotypes, um, this is where it kind of gets a little bit more interesting. So killer whales were originally thought to be what's called monotypic, which basically means all one species. Um, but as we started to find more of them around the world and started to study those different populations, we kind of realized that actually all these populations are a little bit more unique than we thought. So hence comes the idea of an ecotype. So an ecotype, the definition of that is a distinct form or race of a plant or animal species occupying a particular habitat. So basically it's, a, it's part of a bigger species, but it, it has either evolved or become accustomed to living in a specific type of habitat and then has begun to adapt to that specific habitat. And it's not um, different enough to be able to be called either even a subspecies or a other species. Right. It, it is sometimes. All the time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I mean, it is sometimes called an eco species too. So just to be a little oh, really? more confusing. To, yeah. That. Apparently it, it hmm. can be, I've really only That's ever confusing. heard it discussed as ecotype. I know it gets confusing. Um, so like I said, with the orcas, um, a lot of the different populations around the world have become very, very specialized to where they live. So they have, for example, specialized diets, like in Norway, um, the killer whales are, are mostly feeding on herring and other schooling fish. But in Norway, they also have uh, animals that will kill marine mammals. Um, so those are, it's very similar to here. And in the North Pacific here in Washington, we have, um, three different types that we're going to talk about um but we do have what's you know a resident grouping and then uh what's called a transient or marine mammal eating grouping and that's similar to what they have in norway they have a kind of discrete fish eating group and then they that's have our, that's that our actually, residents yeah right right and, and then, then the they have the mammal marine eater. mammal eating yeah and when i say marine mammal a lot of times they're a little bit more opportunistic so they'll take marine mammals but they'll also potentially take like seabirds if they can get mm -hmm. them and that type of thing um and then they have um, some killer whales that live off of New Zealand, some orcas that eat stingrays and sharks, and they've specialized in basically how to capture and kill stingrays and sharks, which I think is possibly one of the coolest ecotype. I think that one's the coolest. Also because like cool. they're so adept that they don't even eat the whole shark. They like slice it open and suck out the liver. And they flip it over so yeah. that it, like it stuns Feel them like, and they, they, they get completely disoriented. It's, it's, it's very cool. It's nice. Very, very cool. Um, and then in Antarctica, they have um, a, actually, they think like up to four or five different groups of killer whales that inhabit the Antarctic waters. Um, and they, depending on which, which ecotype you're talking about, some of them specialize on eating minke whales and seals. Um, some of them specialize on eating the specific types of toothfish that live in Antarctica. So it's pretty crazy. And there's just a huge variation in them. Why don't we know much about those that are in Antarctica? Well, great question. <laughs> because they live in Antarctica. <laughs> so if you've been listening or watching to any of our other marine mammal highlights um, episodes, we have already talked quite a bit about polar species and some of the difficulties that come with studying polar species. <laughs> Namely, it's super cold and uh, very really inhospitable. Water. And mm. especially on the water, yeah, it's very difficult to get there. Um, the waters in and around Antarctica are horrendous. Mm -hmm. um, very, very stormy. And also there's just huge expanses of water where, especially when you don't know much about an animal, you don't necessarily know where to orient your, um, your study or your, your search for It's them. like looking for a needle in a haystack. Exactly. Like, oh, going to go there. That's where they're going to be. I don't know. Exactly. So one of the ecotypes that I want to talk a little bit more about here, just before we get into our specific, um, groups that we have here in Washington is the, what's called the type D ecotype. Um, so Again, if you if you look up or check out the, um, we'll put a little picture of it here for you guys too, but if you look up that image of all the different types of ecotype, you can see that visually they're quite distinct. So some of them are bigger, some of them are smaller, some of them have like a very small um, eye patch, they have a little white eye patch. Some of them have a small one, some of them have a larger one, some of them the, the white eye patch is kind of a yellowish color, which is from the diatoms in the water. Um, so visually, in addition to their dietary specialization visually those ecotypes are also very different from one another um, which is important to note with killer whales because that's really how we started to realize that there were different ecotypes it's like well wait that one is definitely still looks like an like an orca 
And sorry, just different. to clarify, we're using the terms killer whale and orca interchangeably here, just to not confuse anything. <laughs> um, or at least I am, because I do that all the time. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, they actually started to see like, well, it's definitely the same species, but that one looks really different over here. Like they're different enough that it was interesting to um, scientists enough that they started to, to study that a little bit more. So with the type D ecotype, this is actually one of the least known ecotypes of killer whale or orca. Um, and didn't they just get picked, like Jared, Jared Towers, I think went out and they like just got photographic evidence. Yeah, so I'll talk about guys. that. So the first record of type D orcas um, was actually from 1955. Uh, they had 17 of them strand <laughs> off the coast of, I'm gonna butcher this name, I apologize, Para Paralma? Paramu, sure. Paramu, New Zealand. It's a place in New Zealand. I can't, I can't say it. I apologize. Um, so they had 17, what we now know to be type D killer whale strand in 1955. And again, like I said, there were visual distinctions compared to the other orcas that these people had seen. So they have a very small um, eye patch for one. Um, they have a much more rounded, so the, the orcas in general have like a pretty bulbous head, but these guys had a much more rounded head. It almost looks more like a pilot whale head very round, um, has a little bit less of a prominent beak. Um, and it had a much more pointed dorsal fin. So most orcas still have like that very curved or falcate dorsal fin. Um, like I said, the males will get a little bit taller, but these guys have like the tip of the dorsal fin is very pointed, um, which is kind of interesting. And they hadn't seen any killer whales that looked like this before. So that was the first record. And then they basically just thought that was an anomalous record because they didn't hear anything more about these things again. They, nobody saw them, nobody had another encounter with them until about 2005. So a huge difference of time there where we just didn't hear anything about these orcas at all. Nobody saw them or at least none were reported. So in 2005, um, a French scientist actually took pictures of what was a very odd looking killer whale um, that had been uh, I believe by caught, or no, that it had stolen fish from the commercial fishing lines near um, Crozet Island in the Indian Ocean. And again, had those really small eye patches and the bulbous head, and they're also just quite a bit smaller body size um, compared to other, other killer whale ecotypes. So they started to investigate this a little bit more, and funnily enough, they found that actually quite a few anecdotal records indicated that maybe this species was actually Hmm. ecotype species and uh, you know a subspecies or ecotype of other types of killer whale so of course as cindy said researching anything in uh, antarctic waters is going to be a little tricky <laughs> but in 2019 so last year after basically having several of these little breadcrumb trails and people kind of coming forward and saying like oh yeah you know i've actually seen those trying to take fish off my line in this commercial fishery um they actually managed to get a study team together uh, with some very generous anonymous donation funding, uh, which was, that, that was pretty cool. I didn't realize that was how that got funded. Mm. Um, they basically assembled an expedition of international whale experts to go on a trip to Antarctica to find these, find these type D killer whales and try to get biopsy samples from them to run genetics, um, to get photos of them, to basically just get as much information on them as we possibly could. Um, and by biopsying, we mean basically like they they have a little harpoon gunny type thing, and they shoot a little dart into the animal. Yeah, so it's, so it's a little hollow dart, basically. Yeah, so they they really don't feel it too much, but the fact that they're trying to find these guys in the first place and then get close enough to be able to dart them and get some DNA is pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah and one of the things with these guys, because they are so different from the other ecotypes, there has been quite a lot of debate about whether or not they should be considered their own species because they mm. are, they're very isolated down there. They don't seem to, they think that their range may be actually a little bit more widespread than they first thought just because of where they've heard reports of them being sighted. But because we don't see them, um, it's basically, there, there has been a lot of suggestion that maybe they are their own unique species. So that was partly why they wanted to get the genetic data too. So long story short, after several weeks of not finding anything, bopping around in like 40 feet seas in Antarctica and, you know, riding out weather, they finally found them. And um, I'm going to include a link to a video that they took from the deck of the ship, but they spent, got to spend about three hours uh, with a group of 30 whales, which they, you know, approached the vessel multiple times. They were able to get pictures. They were able to get some biopsy samples. Um, they towed a hydrophone, so an underwater microphone, so they could record the calls that the orcas were making. 
Um, and that's another thing within ecotypes too, to say uh, they all have different types of vocalization um, and several of the ecotypes have a really unique vocalization or language that is unique to that ecotype. So we're still waiting for the results basically of that study. Um, but the fact that they were able to get those, that data in the first place and are running the genetics on them to see how closely related they are to other orca species and if they have any you know, unique things about them aside from just how they look that would uh, make them more distinctive. So really, but cool really interesting, like I said, we just know nothing about them, it's crazy. Yeah, and what's really cool, the connection to here is that, that Jared Taros was on that team and he's a researcher up in Canada. Right. Um, so he does stuff off the coast and, and stuff. So it was really cool. And we saw that he posted on Facebook and we we're like, oh my gosh, that is so cool. And they yeah. had the piece like, we got pictures of type D. And we're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so like I said, I'll put a link below about, um, you can watch a little video of just the, uh, that they got from that research vessel and see the whales going past and stuff. And it's, it's pretty incredible that they do look really different. Like if you have seen orcas either in the wild or in, you know, in an aquarium somewhere, um, they look really different to other orca species or other orca types. I think it's so. mainly that really tiny bean white part of the eye. Like yeah, it's, it's like it the patch for most are like <laughs> this big and they're just like squinting and trying to just get you. That's why. Yeah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> so I'm now going to hand over to Trevor who's going to talk a little bit more about some of the ecotypes that we have. So we're going to kind of shift focus now to specifically the eastern North Pacific. So Washington and Canada waters basically. Um, and the types of uh, orca ecotype that we have in this region. So, do we want to chat real quickly about offshores? Because I think Trevor's going to talk about the transients. Yeah, so like I said, we have three different main ecotypes here. We have the residents, we have what's called the transients or bigs killer whale, and um, we also have offshore killer whales. So, the offshores we basically know nothing about. Uh, <laughs> They're there. So, it's a really quick little sum up there. Yeah. Um, They've been cited enough over the years where we know that they are a unique ecotype. We know they're not one that we see often. They are different than the other two types. Um, we don't really have a great handle because they do live so far offshore and likely because of that, their range pattern is a lot larger than um, the other two ecotypes that we can study more closely here. And they don't um, tend to come into the Salish Sea as the other two right. types do. Right. So again, you know, when you're in offshore waters, it's harder <laughs> to study them, especially when you don't know what you're looking for or where, where to look, really. Yeah. Um, but it seems from what we know, as far as I'm aware, that they are a little bit more opportunistic in their food preferences. Um, I know that they have been reported to eat, take sharks as well. Um, and I think they're also just like they'll take marine mammals where they can, Anything. seabirds potentially if they can. Um, likely some fish species as well. So it seems like from what we do know, they're maybe a little bit more generalist, um, which again would make sense if you're living in an offshore right. context, you have opportunity to potentially capture a lot more different types of prey rather than becoming specialized to one particular area. Um, you gotta get what you can get where you right. can get it. <laughs> right, exactly. So like I said, we really don't know a lot about the offshores. Um, but they do exist in this region. It is, you know, there is a very rare chance that you might see one. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it's now, now we'll move into the other two, which we know a fair amount. Right. Of. So yeah. So Trevor, you're going to talk us through the uh, transients or bigs killer whales. Right. So transients, like you mentioned, are the mammal eating primarily, and they get the name bigs because of Michael Biggs, the researcher in the '70s, I think it was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they, the guy Michael Biggs was researching the residents at the time, which we'll, Cindy will talk about a bit, because they wanted to get basically a baseline of the population of the whales in Washington here. And basically that reasoning for aquariums to know how much we can take out of Washington, they wanted to know a capture quota essentially for the whales in Washington. So he was one of the pioneers essentially for photo ID, which is Pac-Man does with the porpoises, but in this case, they were focusing on the white patch and the dorsal fins of the orca. Mm -hmm. And he found out that they kept on seeing these other whales instead of the residents that were not part of the residents. And then he found them transients, even though they're not essential, they're not exactly transient. They're yeah, that name is kind of a misnomer now because the when they saw them, when they first saw them, they weren't around that often. So they called them transient because they came in and they left and you know not always there but 
it's that's now shifting. almost the opposite where the residents are less resident than the transients. So that's why a lot of people have started to try to move back to calling them big killer whales because it's less of a misnomer. Right. Now, a lot of people are confused by resident transient, but it's mainly right. just for, right. not where they go. Right. Yeah. So transients on the West Coast, I think there's three pretty much distinct groupings that they've decided on. So they have the West Coast transients, which is what we see here in the Salish Sea. And then there's the Gulf of Alaska transients, which is about 300 individuals. It's about 300 here as well. And then there's the AT1 transients, which I'll talk about later. They are not doing so great. Oh, nice. But I'll go back into that later. But in transients in general, like you said, marine mammal eaters, so they go after harbor seals, porpoises, sea lions, et cetera, and larger whales if they can. I think, what was it, last year they were going after a gray whale mm -hmm. here in the Puget Sound? Oh. Uh, was it that they were investigating? No, there's one that they investigated the 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 gray whale body, but I don't know. We don't. They don't know if they were actually eating off of it. There was a few, at least like maybe a couple of years ago. There was an attempted kill of a maybe more of a practice for their their yeah. young. But yeah, the if anyone does side note, if anyone's blue watched blue. the Blue Planet, there was a really cool chase sequence that they filmed on the Blue Planet. This is a little plug for David Attenborough. Yeah. Shows. <laughs> but that was one of the it's like it's just a, it's a really epic sequence where they filmed them chasing a gray whale was it and that was but that was the calf right yeah they were going after I mean, the mother and calf yeah basically they try to tire it out until they can't swim anymore and then right yeah. like a four-hour ordeal yeah it's pretty I, I as a mother i just like it's really hard to watch that because you're just watching the mother try to keep the calf safe and just keep going keep going if we keep going they can't get us and then but the baby just can't go anymore and then they take the baby and you just ah uh, yeah. Oh, it's sad but amazing at the same time yeah yeah yep so that's the primary food they'll eat birds too i've seen that before out here they we were watching them and they ate a seal essentially and the birds were coming down to get the scraps and then the whales just grabbed the bird <laughs> wow so that's a kind dangerous of proposition yeah still a bit um, <laughs> yeah I was like oh that's what's my that's my after dinner mint thank you <laughs> Um, they are in smaller group sizes, so if you see a group of whales of like three to six-ish, that's probably transients, versus mm -hmm. you'll talk about the group sizes of the residents later. But there's around 300 or so here in the Salish Sea, a bunch of different pods that they'll intermingle too, basically for mating purposes or hunting purposes, but in general they're pretty distinct three to six member pods. Um, they're not chatty when they're hunting. <laughs> Well, so when they're pursuing a seal, for example, they'll just go silent. So if you hear killer whale calls, they're likely, like on a hydrophone or recording, they're likely residents. These you, ones, you don't, you don't want to tip off your prey. No, exactly. That you're coming. Right, it's fish, exactly. They don't really tune in that that's a whale, but like a seal would probably figure that out. Right. So when they're hunting, they're not very vocal. There's some, they do something called a cryptic click which every few minutes they'll just click to orient themselves and communicate. Ooh, but, like, that's sneaky. I like it. Like, bing. And so it's just but, enough that you're like, I don't know if that's an actual orca call, if that's just some random noise. Mm, exactly. Never. I think they're a little bigger than the residents too, they've decided, just a couple feet longer. Um, they, again, with the whole ecotype species debate, I think they've determined that transients have been genetically distinct for 750,000 years now. Hmm. Well, I think so, especially with the ones that have different, such different diets, like eating fish versus eating marine mammals are very different. Like residents and transients both live here, but they will not intermingle whatsoever. Yeah, they actually actively avoid each other. Right. And what's really weird is that you would think it would be the residents avoiding the transients because, you know, they're mammal eaters or whatever. But what they've noticed is that it's actually the transients that are being like, whoa, the residents are over there. <laughs> Go yeah. over this way. It's really interesting. Yeah. So we got. I'm sure if people around here, if they've seen the white orca in the news, that's a transient mm -hmm. orca. These are the T46Bs, I think. I think that's their pod name. And their naming uh, is very complicated to follow. Yes. I'm like a T46543 nine. Uh, it was actually we explained actually, really well at a workshop that we went to recently where it was like, oh, finally, I understand now what understand. all these different parts of the name mean. It's, it's exactly. Very Except I've now forgotten it again because it was so complicated. I wrote it down in my books. So I'm like, oh, that makes sense now. But yeah, they, they're yeah. trying to keep 
figure out, you know, keeping who who bore who and what family lines there are. So it does their make name sense is their lineage, their basically. Right. Yeah. It's just yeah. that it's a little bit more complicated than the residents. <laughs> it's like I saw that the T eighteens the other day, but it was T eighteen and then three of the ones in that pot are T nineteen. So right, <laughs> right. It's confusing. <laughs> So yeah, that's what we have here in the Salish Sea and then up in the Gulf of Alaska. It's kind of the same scenario, just more positive there. That's third genetically distinct they decided to from the transients here based mm -hmm. on mitochondrial DNA. And then a third group is the AT1 transients, which are in the Prince William Sound and Kenai Fjords of mm -hmm. Alaska in Canada, I believe. And they're, they were a special case. There were 22 of them only. Oh. And then in 1989, there's Exxon Valdez oil spill. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to mention because the, the, that, those group and the Southern residents are the only ones, only orcas that are federally protected. Right. I think they've been declared as depleted. Yes. Because so, that, yeah, the residents are endangered, but, and they're both depleted, but only the residents are endangered. Right. These guys, I, I think they're pretty much functionally extinct at this point. Wow. Yeah, there were 22, and with this oil spill, they said nine of them Seven? just immediately disappeared. Yeah. And then they found another six dead, leaving it to nine, and they haven't had a calf since the spill. So now there's only seven of them, and the two right. females that are left are too old to reproduce. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, sad. and if, we, if, we, if we just remind everybody what functionally extinct means, means oh. they're still around, right? There's still animals there, but they can't continue to reproduce at the rate that would continue the species. So eventually all those animals will die off, and that's it. So they're basically extinct, just not totally yet. Right. So they have, I mean, they've been seen on whale watch boats still. Occasionally, there's one male that travels by itself occasionally. Mm, and and they actually, they'll watch it hunt, but right yeah. now that they've ordered a lot of protections against them, but there's, there's not a lot they can do unless they intermingle with a different transient, but. Right. Right. And it's so sad too, like as a, as a species that is so social, like orcas have one of the most complex societal systems of any marine mammal. And just to like to hear that there's one little guy who's just, I guess I'll just go hunt by myself. Like it's right. just so yeah, sad. Yeah, orcas lone, orcas not, that's not normal, no matter what yeah. ecotype you're talking about. Do we know much about this, the social structure of transients? I know we don't know as much as, as we do obviously about the residents, but they do have matrilines, lines, like they are matrilineal. If you, yeah, they're matrilineal. Um, sometimes reproductive females will go leave the pod to kind of make their own transient pod. Uh, okay. And then the males will occasionally go off for a Real couple of years or forever to go find another reproductively, like reproductive females in a different pod and join that pod. Right. Whereas, you know, you talk about the residents, they're pretty secure within their pod. Yeah, re the residents are very strange in. Mm -hmm. any aspect to talk about but yeah they're, they're just real quickly they're in comparison to that they have a um uh a, the matrilineal line right so the mothers are the the matriarchs um but they are born into a pod and they stay there so the males right. and females both stay with their mother their entire lives which is really rare in any kind of mammal or animal society. Usually the males right. go off to spread their seed in different places and the females oftentimes stay with, with the mothers. Um, so the fact that both of them stay with and in their family pod, not even just like, I'm gonna hang out in the same area and come visit you. Like, no, I'm gonna stay with you your entire life. Um, <laughs> so very different um, than a lot of other uh, species. Yeah. And with the vocalizations, I guess, too, with the socializing, you know, I said they're quiet when they hunt they usually are kind of chatty after they get a kill. It's more oh, like yeah, they're like, yay, we did it. <laughs> Which again is kind of like wolves, you know, that's the same yeah. thing where they'll be very right. silent while hunting and then afterwards they'll celebrate. <laughs> right. We hear the coyotes do that all the time. You hear, and all of a sudden you hear the beep, 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 beep. I'm like, oh, I guess something died. I guess something, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think they're pretty closely bonded. Like with the AT1, that's probably must've been devastating for that whole, yeah. the AT1 transients. When, you know, imagine having a family of 22 and then you just instantly lose 15 of them. Yeah. That must have been just, I mean, oof. can't even imagine. Right. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, okay, the well, the transients. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to be talking about the residents now. We just talked about the transients and a little bit about the offshores that we know 
nothing about. Uh, um, so now we're going to switch to the residence, which I think a lot of people think of as the, when they think of an orca, they think of probably southern residence killer whales because they have been in the news the most, um, more than any other species probably, at least in the United States. Right. Yeah. So um, they, so there's, I'm going to start off saying that there are two different resident groups here in the Salish Sea. There's the southern residents and the northern residents. Um, residents being the ones that eat fish. So these guys are, are strictly fish eaters. Um, and the reason why they're called Southern and Northern is in the 1970s, as Trevor noted, when the, um, the researchers were up, started looking at these animals um, and then saw that there were transients as well. Um, they basically most encountered the Southern residents off of the Southern tip of Vancouver Island. <laughs> And the Northerns were found more in the Northern Vancouver Island region, including Queen Charlotte Sound and Southeast Alaska. So. That'll have a self-explanatory name. <laughs> right, you know, just, just matters of where the Southern and Northern part you're looking at. So that's why right. they're called the Southern residents and the Northern resident populations. So the Southern residents, as we said before, are the only orca, species, orca population that is endangered. Um, and really really small. Um, the northern residents have about 200 individuals and about 34 match lines um, and the southern residents we just have the three pods and there are only 73 animals as of December 31st 2019. Right. So the reason why there's they've gone down so much um, is because it, between 1965 and 75 all three pods were reduced because of captures for uh, marine parks. So a lot of the orcas that you saw in the 70s and 80s in Aquaria were actually from these uh, southern resident killer whales. So there's, um, we, they don't know the historical range of how big the population was because we didn't really start researching them until the 70s and by that point they had already been reduced, unfortunately. Um, but they estimate something like, could possibly be 140, 200, something like that. Um, in wow. 1974, there were only 71. So that's after all the captures basically. Um, then between 95 and 96, there's uh, the two different numbers, 97 or 98 individuals for 95 or 96. <laughs> and in 2001, there was either 79 or 80 individuals. It did, I looked on NOAA and on two different parts in the NOAA website, it had those slightly different numbers. So I'm not sure exactly which one is exactly correct, but they're close enough. Um, so they peaked in the mid 90s and now, as I said, they're down to 73 as of today. So the lowest number since the 70s. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about why that's occurring, but um, so these guys are in three different pods, the J, K, and L pods, and as we talked about before with the uh, vocalizations, they have basically all have dialects, is what they kind of equate them to. Um, so the J pod have their own calls, the K pod have their own calls, the L pods have their own calls, um, and I think they do share, um, there are some calls that are shared between pods. Um, yeah, I think it's usually like the S1 and S3 calls, I believe, are shared across most of the pods. Right. Um, but then they each have their own little, like, basically way of speaking. So it's really cool that you can just put the hydrophone in the water and know who you're listening to. Which I think That's something I didn't touch on with the transients, too. They had all the transients in the Salish Sea generally have the same dialect. So I didn't interesting that earlier, but... Oh, that's interesting, yeah. The, the residents here are so intermingled, but they all have different dialects versus... They're all spread out for the transients, and they all have the same one. -ish. Yeah, so mm. the, yeah, that probably goes back to more some of the social structure differences in these animals, right? Because um, if again, the for these guys, the males and females stay with their family the entire time. So if you're in these little cohorts, <laughs> and you're only speaking to each other, you're you're gonna end up having some of those more distinct dialects. Um, I mean, it's kind of like in a family, like you end up having your own weird little like in language with your family usually yeah. where it's like certain references that mm -hmm. you just say a word and it makes mean something to you, but anyone else listening to your conversations like, like, what are okay. you talking about? <laughs> At least in my family, <laughs> we did that. I don't know about you guys, but <laughs> I, I think that works in families and friend groups too. Like you have those yeah, in jokes yeah. and stuff like that. I mean, even if you look in countries, there are certain, I mean, look in Shetland, right? There are certain, mm. Is, is certain di like dialects and, and a lot of other places where there's certain places that have a slightly different way of speaking in England and stuff too, right? There's, right, um, or in, in Scotland, you know, all those ones where it's like, oh, that's from that place. Oh, they're from that place. I mean, even here in the United right. States, you got a Boston accent, you have, um, you know, a Southern accent, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, cool. It's kind of interesting. Um, so, let's see. I, what's really interesting, I'm going to try to go into some of the, the, 
basics of them, but really whenever you look anything, if you look up Southern Resident Killer Whales, it's all about why they're dying <laughs> and everything and nothing about like actually stuff that we know about them. Um, so they are um, sexually dimorphic um, and we already kind of talked about that, basically the dorsal fin is more, for most orcas. Um, males get sexually mature about 25 and females are mature around 15 and sexually mature in their early teens. Um, the males are slightly bigger than females, and that's my baby in the background, if you can hear. <laughs> um, and uh, females are reproductively active until about 40 years of age. Um, and what's interesting is that these are one of the few species that have senescence. So it's basically, um, what do we call it in humans? Menopause. There we go. But they call it senescence in animals, um, where the females are still in the population and very important in the population past their reproductive years. So most other species, it's you, you give birth until you die and then that's all you got. Woo! <laughs> uh, but these guys, the mothers are really, really important and grandmothers um, holding knowledge that they pass down to other generations um, and can be part of the reason why they're having problems right now. I know. Daddy. Like, really interesting. <laughs> that's right. Because this is amazing. Um, <laughs> and if you wanted to tell the difference between a male and a female orca, you have to look at their belly. Um, and their white pattern that's around the genital area is more rounded for females and a more straight for, um, for males. So There you go. That's cool. You know, if you ever see the underside of an orca, which they oftentimes will do, roll around at the surface and you go, oh, hey, look at that. Yeah. Until they're adults and then you can go, oh, the six foot giant dorsal fin. <laughs> that's really straight. That's a male. Okay. Um, so the, um, the mortality rate for, for, uh, Southern resident killer whale calves is really high. So in most mammals, it's about 25% for the first, for the first year of life, a quarter of the animals will die. But for Southern resident killer whales, the mortality in the first year is between 37 and 50%. Wow. So it's really, and there's some reasons to why that is, but that's already adding on to the fact that they're not doing well. And then half of their, up to half of their babies will die in the first year, which is terrible. So um, they spend the spring, summer, and fall in the Salish Sea, in and out. They're not always here. Um, in the winter, though, they've been seen as far south as Central California and as far north as Southeast Alaska. I think that was the L pod gotcha. that was up there. Cool. Um, and <laughs> is she really distracting? Because <laughs> I can't tell. I feel like it's just making it super interesting. OK, <laughs> super cute. Babies are adorable. Um, so, uh, so, and what's interesting is that they've, we used to see them like summer, that was the time to go see the Southern residents and they were always here. And recently that has not been the case. Um, and sometimes there's been a whole month that we haven't seen them and that hasn't happened in the 30 years that we've been looking for them. So they're, where they are during the year is different than it was before. And again, why the transients now are somewhat more resident than the residents. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and we're going to take the baby over here and then see if she wants to come down by being helped. Yeah, because she's very talkative. Okay, um, so the average lifespan for females is about 50 years. Uh, but then we do have Granny that was estimated to be 106 before she was before she disappeared. Yeah. So they can live a long time. <laughs> um, male average is only about 29 years and max is about 50 to 60 as males will generally, as males generally do in populations are a bit more rough and tough and tumble and uh, <laughs> uh, are more likely to pass earlier. Um, with so the, hmm? with Granny's death, because she did pass away, right. um, did we see odd behavior with that pod? Because she was the match line for that pod, I believe. Yeah, she was. Yes, she um, was. You know, I don't, I'm not sure. I'm assuming there was, there must have been some kind of shifts or whatnot, but if they have other females that have learned as much, you know, as much as they could from granny, then it, they may her. not have been as, because she was the grandmother versus being the direct mother. Ah. Um, I think you maybe have less. Um, and I'll let, that's a good segue into that. Um, the, it was, it's really interesting um, because the, the mothers are the, the linchpin, basically. If the mom dies, it can have a large effect on the, pot, the health of that, that pod. 
um, and particularly for males. So the males that are on the fringes of the social network um, are at greater risk of dying. Um, and a lot of this has to do with they're relying on food sharing. So these orcas will t bring salmon up and then rip it apart and share it with their family. Um, so the males um, are bigger, need more food. And if they're also reliant on their mother <laughs> for feeding them into adulthood, um, it can cause them to have a bigger risk of dying. Um, the death of a mother increases an adult male's own risk of dying by eight times for the next two years. Wow. Yeah, and that's an adult male. This is, we're not talking about calves or juveniles here. Like, so it's really interesting that the adults become so reliant or re remain reliant on their mother in a lot of ways. Um, and so the moms will share more with their sons than with their daughters, which I thought was also interesting. Um, and they think that the investment uh, is because it passes on more of her genes because the father can, you know, the, a boy can mate and have a lot of babies. One female right. will only have one, you know, however many babies over her lifetime. But um, so the, the chances of passing on the mom's genes is increased through the son. Um, so again, more reliance though then makes a problem when your mom dies and you don't have other people to help you catch your food. Um, so I thought that was very, uh, very interesting. And again, very different from other um, orca populations and, and other mammals in general. This is kind of an oddity. Now, I guess I have a follow-up question too. Mm -hmm. The I know there's one orca that lived in one pod, and I think his mom died. And the L pod, the L, it's like L eighty one or something like that. Yeah, he yeah. he went over to J pod. Yeah, so that's basically looking for. I can't remember if it was like different mom or essentially. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. Why. I mean, I think just trying to get another pod that I'm not sure. It's I don't think they know why exactly he decided to try to jump jump pods because right. l pod also has is the largest it has 34 members right and j pods the small uh there, the medium. Hmm? there was a talk that was given when we were at the last ways of whales workshop um this year about the questions of paternity in oh, right killer whales though so there was something put forward at that talk where they were questioning if perhaps there was actually a familial link for him with J Pod, and we just weren't aware of it yet. Right. So that there, there may actually be like a genetic uh, could be more relation we're than we're thinking of yet. Right. Well, and so they have the super pods, right? So when basically two or more of the pods get together and they have a big gold giant party, um, and basically we think that's probably for mating, bonding, inf information sharing, um, maybe uh, culturally important for these animals. So it could be that an L pod and J pod got together, had a baby, and then, you know, so they're somewhat related. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's an idea. And like I said, I don't think there's anything that's been, there's nothing proving that yet, but right. Um, yeah. Anyway, just an idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's all interesting. We're still learning, you know, after 30 years, still learning quite a bit about these animals and, and what's going on with them. Um, Oh, and so uh, food is also very important. So the, the social structure that they have with these matrilineal lines um, and how often they get together in these groups coincides with um, the salmon runs. So when the salmon runs are less abundant, the networks are less connected, less interconnected. Hmm. <clears throat> and they see less cohesive behavior um, of groups coming together during uh, when there's a po the population decline in the 90s, they saw there was less groupings and things like that. So what they think is that if you're staying in smaller groups, then there you have more food for each animal than if you're in these larger groups right. um, socializing. So their social structure can shift somewhat depending on their food source. I know, oh, yes, that's very interesting. Um, so, <laughs> Sound effects, y'all. Very talkative today. Um, so the the food situation. She's really like, hello. Could I have some food? So the food situation is really what the the, the biggest things that we want to talk about with these animals. Um, these they can travel up to seventy five miles an hour, miles a day. Sustained speeds of over eight miles an hour. They can go as fast as thirty miles an hour, short periods of time. So to do all that, <laughs> they need to eat. And because they are strictly fish eaters, um, and mainly uh, basically salmon, 
um, they have to eat um, a lot of food. The percentage of how much, what species of salmon that they're eating, right? They are mainly Chinook eaters. And the reason why they are mainly Chinook eaters is because it is the largest and the heaviest of the seven species found in the Pacific Northwest. So it basically, if you become a specialist and only eat those, uh, it makes sense because they're the, the most bang for your buck, right? They can grab the, um, the biggest fish and fattiest fish and have to eat less of them than other species. Um, and I think I read a, in one of the papers, it was like four to five other salmon would equal one, eating one big Chinook. Mm -hmm. So it's a big thing. Um, and because of that, so about 80% of their diet is Chinook. Um, and these, a southern resident, one southern resident killer whale needs 18 to 25 Chinook a day to meet the energy requirements for that animal, which means that's 1,400 per day for all the population, and that equals half a million salmon a year. So wow. they need quite a few. <laughs> right. So um, um, the, um, and if, it's really interesting, there is a graph on the Center for Whale Research. Uh, which shows the ups and downs in the salmon runs, and it's particularly the Chinook, and then the ups and downs in the decline and, and increase in the population for the southern residents, and they match up almost exactly, where it's an mm -hmm. increase in, you know, increase and decreases, um, increase in population for the, for the uh, Chinook means there's more food and the um, resident killer whales can increase. <clears throat> so, they, um, there's something else about the, um, oh, oh yeah, so the main reason, uh, one of the main reasons why they're not doing well is because the salmon runs, as we kind of mentioned before, are not doing well. <laughs> They've basically been overfished, um, and so their numbers are greatly reduced, and it used to be very common to, to get huge Chinook, like 50, 70, 80 pounds, and now that's more of a rarity. So, uh, I saw one paper they were talking about the fact that the southern residents, because they are down here and the northern residents are up above, a lot of the salmon are coming down the river, going up into Alaska, doing their thing, and then coming back down. Well, before they get down here, they're hitting the, the northern residents and, and other fisheries and things like that, perhaps um, are grabbing all those bigger Chinook before they come down to our area. So mm. they were already getting reduced in size and number by the time they reach where the Southern residents can eat them. So right. that doesn't help. I know a lot so, of fishermen are, are upset. My most commonly seen complaint about the laws regarding fishing because of the orcas, they always complain about all the seals are taking all the fish yeah, the in the world, which I mean, yeah, they're taking fish too. They are, but not nearly the number that- Not that much of an effect. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, and, and that's the thing, there's, it's not like, yes, the seals and sea lions are taking fish, but we also have the orcas that are taking fish, and we have humans, which are taking way more fish than anybody else. <laughs> um, I mean, if you just even look at the, right, so a southern resident needs 15 to 25 a day, but how many does a fisherman take out in the, of the water in one, one go when we have all our nets and commercial fishing, that kind of thing, so it's a complicated right. issue. Um, so we have the reduced quantity and quality of prey, so the, the salmon are smaller and there's fewer of them. Um, we have persistent organic pollutants, um, so these ones are still a problem, um, chemicals in the water, uh, and they uh, basically get taken up and uh, orcas are at the top of the food chain, so through uh, bioaccumulation and biomagnification, so it accumulates in one animal and it magnifies up the food chain, by the time you get to the southern residents, they have a large amount of, of these chemicals in their bodies, a lot of times also because they are fat soluble and so they get stored in the blubber. And this can cause immune and reproductive dysfunction. And if you have a lowered immune efficiency, <clears throat> um, a lower immune system, uh, you're then more susceptible to other things that could end up causing your death. Um, the reproductive system is interesting and this is, um, one of the problems is that there hasn't really been viable calves in the last few years. I think maybe one or two now has survived, but for there was a period of like five years where there were no living calves. Right. And um, particularly for first time female, um, first parturition females, that the first time they give birth, 
um, unfortunately, they dump all of the chemicals or a lot of the chemicals that they have into the milk because basically it offloads and goes into the, the calf. Now the calf then takes that and now they have a lowered Im immune system and all these chemicals in their bodies. And that probably is part of the reason why they have such a high mortality rate in the first year of life, uh, partly. Um, once the female has given birth once, that doesn't, it, they don't uh, store up and then dump as they have, you know, they'll store it for a little bit and then dump it off, but it won't be as much as that first, you know, you know, 15 to 25 years of life that they've been able to accumulate all that stuff. <clears throat> so there's that. And then also there's noise and disturbance from vessels. So there is a big debate over whether whale watching boats should be out there, um, whether it's the noise, you know, the tankers, um, you know, there's so, and then there's, there's the regular people going out in their boats. So we do know that noise is a problem and disturbance from vessels is a problem if they are, if you stop them from basically foraging for however long, that's that much less time they have to forage and find food. Um, noise can also mask their echolocation and mask their calls. So, you know, we kind of talk about it um, when we do presentations that if we were, if I was giving a presentation and everybody was talking, how much louder would I have to be in order for you to hear me and how long could I keep that up before I lost my voice and it's a very similar thing here if they if there's noise all the time they have to call you know talk at a higher pitch or, or louder um, and there's only so long you can do that and at some point it won't even carry in the water right that's just a huge amount of energy used for that yeah. just to do what you should be doing normally but it's just increased 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 Exactly. So now you also you reduce quantity and quality of prey. You may have chemicals in your body, and now you're putting more energy into something that should take you less energy to do. So all of those things go together as a really to put against them being able to do what they need to do, find their food, and survive. Um, so it's not just one thing. It's not just saying, oh, it's the boat's problem. It's the seal's problem. It's the fisherman's problem. You know, there's a lot of things that are going against these animals. So it's important to keep that in perspective when we talk about trying what things can we do to help help them. Um, yeah. Cause it's not just gonna be one thing that we can go, boop, that saves them. Right, unfortunately. Um, I think I had one more thing to talk about with them, but, um, oh, so the one thing I do wanna mention with the um, culture and their, just the the fact that they have culture, right? This is one of the um, few animals, or not few animals now, but one of the first ones that we saw, and you could see that there are there is culture to these animals. There is um, the the passage of knowledge from mother to and and down to sons and daughters, um, because that's what culture is basically: is that you have knowledge and you pass it on through future generations, and it gets continued. So we do see that, and one. Um, I kind of want to bring up is when people say like, no, they, you know, they still trying to say that they don't have it, whatever. You can just look at the, at J35, which two years ago, I think it was two years ago now, mm -hmm. she carried a newborn, her newborn dead calf for 17 days and a thousand miles mourning it. And if you can't look at that and say that that is mourning and that they, you know, are aware of things, then I, I just don't, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Because you, you're not going to do that normally, um, and there has been cases of other of other uh, cetaceans carrying dead calves, um, and and looks like they're actively mourning over two or three days. But this, she basically took this to a, a an entirely different level, um, and honestly, I think the only reason she stopped at 17 days was because there wasn't anything left of the calf to carry at that point. Right, it's started to degrade. So. Um, they are very social, they are very intelligent, and they are, you know, they have culture, and they have this amazing society that we're still learning so much about, um, but we're, they're at risk of not being there anymore. Um, so there's a big push to help to try to save these animals. Um, people are going for tearing down the dams so that there's more fish. You know, there's basically all these camps they need food and that's the only really thing that matters. Um, there's the boat problem. That's the only thing that matters if they can't. So there's the, there's not enough food. 
but there's also if there is even if there is enough food if they can't find the food because of the noise then it negates it so it, right it's like where <laughs> where do we start i don't know um right. And, but everybody in their camps is very, very strongly, this is what needs to happen. And that can be a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing in that it stops us from being able to talk a bit more and compromise and, and, and try to look for a, a problem of, of something that we can fix. <laughs> no. So um, not to be a downer, but <laughs> cause that's basically where we are with these animals. I mean, we, they're amazing. They're this complex social structure. Um, and all this really cool stuff, but we're at risk of losing them. And that also goes back to the Northern residents. Why aren't the Northern residents having a problem? Right. And so right. some, you know, some, some, they are farther North. Um, we are very, more, a bit more congested down here in the Southern area in the Sailor Sea. Um, there's just a lot of boats and a lot of other things. I mean, there's still stuff up in the Northern area, but just to a lesser degree. Um, and they, 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 they're both mainly Chinook eaters, but I think perhaps the Northerns are a little bit more open into which, uh, which fish they take. So, yeah, I think they're a little bit less picky as far as I'm aware. Yeah. I mean, I did look up something and it did good. say that they're, they are mainly Chinook as well, but, uh, I think they're less, um, less focused Fussy. on Chinook then. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. If you are a picky eater, in the mammal, in the, in the world, in, in the animal world, if you decide that's what I'm gonna eat and that's all I'm gonna eat, you are going to have a problem if something happens to that food source, right? Harbor seals, for example, whoa, they eat a lot of things. They have like <laughs> 40 or 50 species that they'll eat. They're not picky at all and they're doing pretty good. Um, and that's not the only reason, but that is part, part of it, right? If you're able to eat whatever's out there, then if one of those species goes down, it doesn't matter because you've got five other things or more you can eat. So right. that's, yeah, that's part of the problem. Um, uh, and, you know, and there may be less, you know, the less boats and less noise. I no, don't know if anybody's looked at that specifically, but it does seem that the Northern animals in their habitat have just a different, um, a different, different things going on, um, and that right. the, different the pressures, things, different pressures. Thank you, um, and that they are able to deal with them a bit better. Right. Um, and it's to go back to the what Trevor I think said earlier was functionally extinct. You know, I don't. We don't know when that's going to be the case. Um, again, the um, uh, K pod only has seventeen members. J pod is twenty two. L pod is thirty four. And those numbers are fine, but if all the, if most of those are males, if you don't have enough reproductively active females in your pod, then there's, oh, it's just a matter of time, right? Right. Um, and if, you know, and then will they come together? Like L, the, you know, the guy, the male from L went over to J pod. So if some stuff like that happens, then perhaps there is a bit more time that we have. Um, but it really depends on, on how many reproductively active females you have. <laughs> left in the population. And right. then also too though, if you have those reproductive active females, but they didn't get to learn or they don't know all those ins and outs from their mothers and their grandmothers, they will be less good at, per, per, perhaps, um, less good at being able to find the food and knowing where that is and knowing right. when these changes happen, right? So granny knew things from a hundred years ago that kind of knowledge is invaluable. So yeah. depending on how much knowledge got, got passed on to those that are left will also will impact greatly how well right. these animals will do. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah. That's it about the Southern residents. <laughs> They're super cool, but they are in danger of becoming extinct. And I'm hope, I hope that, when we can talk about it and people talk about them, that we can discuss and find the right way to go rather than just yelling at each other and trying to end up with nothing. Yeah, yeah. that'd be really nice. Yeah, so if we can all talk about it, hopefully um, we can do something. But what can you do right now? Well, you can um, go to things like the Orca um, or, uh, Center for Whale Research, um, the Whale Museum, um, the various, there's, there's 
there's not a, a small amount of orca groups that are out there. <laughs> and they're all trying to do research and help these animals. Um, and I forgot uh, what Deborah Giles's group was called. Uh, I can't remember. Conservation Center for Conservation Research. Center for conservation, uh, yeah, I think something like that. Um, and they're really cool because she's got the dog, Eba, Eba the whale poop sniffing dog. So it's super awesome. They're out there doing research, trying to get their poop so they can get um, genetics and also then see what they're eating and all that kind of stuff. So there's some really great research going out there. So you can go to any of those organizations and um, um, donate and help somewhere. them with their research. Um, yeah, and just learn more about what they do too. I mean, that's right. one of the biggest things is just also like, you know, making making yourself aware and and learning more about the issues that are facing these animals and the different arguments for and against the different you know different viewpoints. It's just again, like you said, it just makes for a more informed conversation rather than um, shutting people down or not being willing to listen to other people's perspectives because everyone you know whether you agree with it or not, everyone does have a reason for what they're saying, so. Right, and a yep. lot of them do have, you know, very passionate about their, their views because of their experiences or the knowledge that they have. And so the more, the, the more you know, the better it is and the better you can talk with other people. Right. Um, so look up any of those groups. You can also uh, volunteer with them. There's also the Orca Network, which goes and, um, you know, you can send sightings into them and so you can track um, where they are in and in, in, in around the, the Salish Sea. Um, so there's lots of groups that you can get involved with um, to try and help these guys. So uh, that's it for the orcas. Um, hope you enjoyed it. Um, it's always fun talking about orcas because everybody loves orcas. Like the big sea pandas. <laughs> the big ones. That's the funny. Big ones. <laughs> um, so uh, that's it for this week, and we'll be back on, on the next time with some cetacean or pinniped or marine mammal that we'll think <laughs> it'll be interesting to talk about. Maybe we'll hey. talk about harbor porpoises next week. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. That would be fun. Um, so anyway, uh, if you have anything that you want us to talk about, again, leave the comments or send us an email, and um, we'll see you the next time. Bye. Bye. This was brought to you by Pacific Mammal Research, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Each species we discuss has their own write up in our blog. Head to our website, www.pacmam.org, that's P A C M A M.org, to check it out. Also, help us continue providing fun and educational content like this by donating today. Your help is how we can continue to do our work and share it with you. Thanks.